Good morning. It is a privilege for me to be with you, very much so since uh, I've been here with you before and also my relationship with Harold. Um, I just really appreciated the worship. I, I really did. I, I love some of those old hymns as well, and some of those kind of... Uh, fit right in maybe to my heart and some of the things that I'm thinking of in reference to uh, what we want to get into and in, into Job. So I hope that will come alive as well. As uh, Harold was saying, Job has been a particular book that I have been interested in. I got involved in it back in seminary where I was uh, in a Old Testament survey class. I began to uh, uh, one of the uh, items that they asked us to do, and it just happened to fell, fall into my hands, was to look at the theme of Job and try to figure it out. Now, that is quite an undertaking. <laughs> and over the years, I, uh, as I felt like the Lord was leading me to a greater understanding, I began to do more work on it, and it eventually led to that commentary. I've always wanted to preach on Job. Now, this is not the first time, actually, over in Crosswinds, I've preached a couple of messages on the first couple of chapters. But uh, Lord willing, uh, I will not run you off <laughs> as we look at Job, because some people don't really like to get into the book of Job. I think it is rich with an understanding of God as a saving God. All the things that we're singing about. Um, I want to lead you to read the first chapter. So if I may, and you have your Bibles, let's read the first chapter of Job and we'll look at it. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys and a very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the east. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. Now I'm assuming that would be his birthday, special day. On his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed... Their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it, the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, the blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of the Lord. Now on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. 
While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. It's quite a story, isn't it? Pretty dramatic story. Job's broken down. First two chapters are prose. It kind of tells the story, what happened. A good man has bad things take place in his life. The last portion of the chapter of 42, this is a section of it, is also prose, and it tells the kind of turnaround that takes place with Job. That after his repentance, it says that God restored and he had uh, seven sons and three daughters. It's kind of a nice couplet, so to speak. In the middle, it is filled with poetry. And people have wrestled with what has gone on with the poetry. Sometimes it's difficult to understand the flow and the ebb. There's a debate that's going on, and there's three rounds of that debate. And eventually, then there's a young man who comes and gets involved. And it seems like he is angry with some of the things that have been spoken, not only in reference to Job, but the three friends. God finally makes his entrance. And it's the longest speeches of the Lord in the scriptures that are in the book of Job. Do you realize that? That he speaks openly. Now, of course, the whole word of God is the Lord speaking to us. But speaking directly with somebody, it's put together in a unique way. It is really an epic story. An epic story filled with beauty and grandeur. Victor Hugo, you know who he is? He is a French uh, writer wrote Les Miserables, if you know that story, and there's a musical that's associated with that as well. He says this, Tomorrow, if all literature was to be destroyed and it was left to me to retain one work only, I should save Job. Interesting statement. Um, Adam Clark, who is a commentator in the 1800s, called it the singular book of the whole of sacred scripture. Foremost book of the Bible is what he's talking about. Now, I know that some uh, would not suggest that. I have a friend who really loves Isaiah, and I think Isaiah is great. <laughs> but I have been immersed in the book of Job, and I understand what he's saying. Michael Brown, who's a present-day commentator, writes this. Part of the grandeur of Job is, is the mystery of Job, a book where the solutions themselves are riddles. They come to us in, in the form kind of a riddles. How do you make something out of the midst of what is happening there? There's some question. One of the big questions is, is when God comes to speak to Job, what, is, what in the world is he saying? And does he simply come to beat him down in such a way that he says, you just got to accept it for what it is. And, and I am God. And people don't necessarily like that. One of the big questions surrounds the theme of Job. What is the essential message that we are to take from Job? Is it suffering? Because so much of what goes on here expresses suffering. We've already seen something of the nature of it in chapter 1. And it unfolds with even greater power. And when you get into the, the poetry of it, the depth of that, the depth of the expression of that comes through. Job will later say, God is, has uprooted me like a tree. Right from the roots, <laughs> uprooted me. As he expresses what is going on in his heart. And in some sense, it does teach us how to deal with suffering. Suffering is used to purify 
the young man says something of the nature of that, but God never addresses the issue of suffering when he speaks to him. Isn't that fascinating? Because something else is going on as well. Some say that it's talking about wisdom. All the speakers, most all the speakers, and especially Job's friends, but Job enters into this as well, understand something of the nature of wisdom in this fashion. If you're good, God will bless. If you're bad, judgment will come. You know, Proverbs is filled with that kind of thought. It's there. And uh, they try to emphasize that wisdom, the wisdom of God. But the life of Job destroys this simple formula <laughs> as he gets into it because it describes him so prominently as a righteous man. Why would God do this to him and bring him into that kind of dilemma? And that's really what's driving him through the whole thing. Why, God? Why are you doing this? Some believe that it's talking about the uh, sovereignty of God, that he is sovereign, um, and that he does whatever he wants whenever he wants. We just need to trust him. And yet that seems kind of harsh, as I've already mentioned. Um, all of these things, all of these principles, these themes have an impact in the midst of Job. But I would suggest that, and I, and I, I want you to hold this, because as I was doing my study, I, I came to this theme, and it's a very simple statement, that salvation is in God alone. That that's what he's seeking to impress upon them. Salvation is in God alone. It is his work completely. And we were saying about that. We're talking about Jesus Christ. Everything leads to him in, in a true sense. It's not our own self-effort. It's not our own ability to bring his kingdom to this earth. We are absolutely dependent upon his promise to send a savior. And I would suggest that one of the themes, one of the things that comes out in the midst of the struggle is this yearning for a mediator. For a coming one, Job says this in, in chapter 9. He says there's not an umpire there, somebody that's a go-between God and I. He brings it out in chapter 16 later and speaks about a witness. You know that famous passage in chapter 19, I know my Redeemer lives. And I really think what he's saying in that passage is, is that God is my Redeemer and he's not going to cast me away. And so there is established within his heart the knowledge, the recognition that God is for him and he will not give up on him and so Satan can step aside. And yet it continues on. The passage continues on. I think the young man Elihu talks about a, a messenger who is there. And many think that the messenger would be a Messiah. Ultimately, I came to see something that, which I'm not going to expound on right at the moment, but you can grapple with this in the second speech of the Lord, that there is a reference to a coming one who will destroy Leviathan. And Leviathan is the very person of evil. Satan's in the first chapter. He's also in that chapter. You have to do some study, do some reflection on that. It says that Leviathan is king over the children of pride in that passage. In the midst of that, it speaks about a coming one. And I think what Job realizes is that coming one is God himself. Now, that's early on, all right. But it's profound in what's happening here. Because you see, our hope and our trust is what is in what God himself will do. And all of this is a stage set in order to drive home the reality of this understanding. 
that what Job is looking for is not something within himself to establish his own righteousness, but what God himself will accomplish. So salvation is in God alone. But you know why that is so important? And I know I'm taking time here as before we get into the book here. Because we live in a society where people honestly think and believe, especially secular society, but it's invaded the church as well, honestly think that we can accomplish God's will without God, that we can establish things without him. And you see it in so many different ways. I always go back to the illustration of the, of the fact that people think that they can control the seas. You know, We can keep the seas from over, overcoming the, the edges of the land. God says he's the one that's able to do that. But it kind of filters into the church as well. And the way it expresses itself oftentimes is that we think in some fashion, we believe in Jesus, but in some fashion, we have to do something to make that better or to make that secure. And so we fall into legalism. We fall into doing things that would reinforce what, what really ought to be simply a faith in and the greatness of his finished work. So what I believe God is doing is he's using Job. He's brought him into the midst of this situation, not just to expand his own heart, which he does, but you see at the end of the book is that Job takes on, again, a relationship as a priest. He's a priest of his own family in a, in a marvelous way in the first chapter, but he does so as well at the end with his three friends. God says to them, my wrath is kindled against you to the three friends. Now, I think what, he's, what God is saying is, is that you pretend to know me. You do not know me. You say some great things about me, but you're lost. You need to take seven bulls and offer a sacrifice. All the sacrifices look forward to Jesus. They're all pointing toward Jesus as the final sacrifice. But then in the midst of that, then God says to, to them, then you go to Job, and Job will pray for you. And he becomes a mediator. What I believe God is doing is, is he's using Job in order to reach a, uh, if you will, a society that had begun to imagine that they themselves could accomplish what only God himself can accomplish. They were not truly living in faith. And so we're called to the same thing. We're called to realize that we are to be absolutely established in our relationship with Jesus in such a way that he would use us, that we would be a channel of his grace. And that channel and that using may be something where he causes us to suffer, to be persecuted. The reality of that may be around the corner. Do you realize that? The, the strong reality may be right around the corner. So I see this book as important. I do. And we want to get into it. So let's take a look at it. First of all, let's look at the person of Job, this display of his character in verses 1 through 5. This is a, in a very short section here. There are marvelous things that are said about Job. First of all, I think he's a real person. He's not a myth. This is not just a story, all right? This is a real person who existed, a man of flesh and blood, a man who dealt with the problems that are described here. Ezekiel 14 speaks of him as a righteous man alongside Noah and Daniel. James 5, and I'm sure you probably know James 5. It says there, you have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. Job is a real person who is facing these things. 
And there are many who say that he's just a myth. Or some of these things happened and it was expanded in terms of literature. No, I, I believe the story that's being told here is real. So that we might know what has taken place. It says that he lived in the land of Uz. Now, nobody fully knows where Uz was. But most of them, most people think that it might have been close to what was, event, was originally Edom. On the, uh, the east side of the Jordan, it would have been the country of Jordan today. And I think that's probably true. He was close enough, in, in my mind, to have seen the, the Jordan River flow down, maybe in its flood stage, because he uses an image of that later on in reference to Behemoth and Leviathan. Um, he is a righteous and a good man. First of all, when did he live? Well, many suggest patriarchal times. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people think that maybe it was close to the time of Jacob. And one of the reasons they do this, they think that Moses wrote the book of Job. Now, I, I don't know. But I tend to think that probably not Moses. Um, I, I think maybe it's earlier. And one of the reasons I do is because at the end of the book of Job, it, it describes maybe the length of his life. It says that he lay, lived 140 years longer. And if you half that, because Job was doubly blessed in, in chapter 42, then maybe all this problem happened on him when he was about 70 years old. He had 10 children. Most of them were older. I have 10 children as well. I'm in my 70s. So I can relate pretty well. Um, but you put those numbers together, and if he'd have died, it probably would have been about a 210. You go back into your scriptures, and what you'll find is, is that most of the people that were living to that age were in reference to the father of Abraham. So I tend to think Job is before Abraham and sets the stage, if you will, for the fact that Abraham is the line of the Messiah is going to come through him. Now, who wrote it? I don't really know. Maybe Elihu. Look at the description of Job. He is a righteous and a good man. He is a man of faith, is really what we're saying. Four qualities, they're distinct and revealing. God uses the same ones later on. Blameless. He is a man full of integrity. There was no hypocrisy or deceitfulness in him. No lie was used to take advantage of others. He was upright. He was straight as an arrow, if you will, doing what was right because it was right. He was honest and moral. So those first two talk about his relationship with others. These next two talk about his relationship with God, fearing God. He expressed real reverence for God. He was God was ruler, the worthy ruler of the universe. And you'll see that in a number of different ways, even in the midst of his antagonism, if you will, or his complaint, some of which we'll get into in chapter 3 in a couple of weeks. Even in all of that, still, there's something driving him that makes him realize that God is worthy to be honored, turning away from evil. His life was filled with obedience. He understood wrong and he avoided it. This open testimony, it's supported by God. The problems that come on Job are not a result of his unrighteousness or something that's down deep and hidden. The friends are going to begin to express that sort of thing with him. They're going to assume it, presume it, if you will. And that's not uncommon in the world that we live, you understand. Because the, oftentimes there are people who will come alongside. If something bad has happened to you, they want to find out. What did you do that was wrong? What would you do? Well, that's not the case. Let's go. Look for me, with me for a moment in chapter 29. And this is a place where Job describes himself and the kind of character that he was. And I'm going to start in verse 7. And he's describing his life and the way that he lived his life with others. 
When I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the square, the young men saw me and hid themselves. They, they, they honored him. They understood that he was somebody of importance. The old men arose and stood. The princes stopped talking and put their hands on their mouths. The voice of the nobles was hushed and their tongue stuck to the palate. Here's where I want to get to. For when the ear heard, it called me blessed. And when the eye saw, it gave witness of me because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the orphan who had no helper. The blessing of the one ready to perish came upon me and I made the widow's heart sing for joy. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I investigated the case which I did not know. I broke the jaws of the wicked and snatched the prey from his teeth. You see the descriptiveness of the way in which Job lived his life. He cared for people. He was concerned about people. Now, it's in chapter 29. It expands even more so in chapter 31 in the way in which he lived. Job's very heart was tuned to doing what was right. Trouble does not come because of sin. God is doing something far greater with Job. Job was blessed by God he had children, abundance of animals. He was the greatest of, of all the men of the East, the wealthiest, the most powerful in society. All of that there is, is a part of his life. And I would suggest that there is a principle being lived out here from, whom, from everyone who has been given much. Jesus said this, from everyone who has been given much. You remember what comes after that? Much will be required. God had set him in all of this and blessed him. And he means to use this. And I would suggest for us, okay, because I'm making some identification with Job as we go through here. We have unfathomable riches in Christ. Paul talks about those. The riches that we have been given in relationship with Jesus. So, Job is a blessed man. And he understands that that blessing actually comes from God himself. Back in chapter 29, um, he says, As in the days when God watched over me, with, when his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness as I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship of God was over my tent. When the Almighty was yet with me and my children were around me, when my steps were bathed in butter and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. Job knows and understands that all of this blessing has come from God himself and he describes his relationship with God as being a friend of God. That's a song, isn't it? I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. That's foundational. Look at what takes place in, in, in relationship to these children because this is fascinating to me and later on it plays an even greater part as they begin to talk about sin in other portions of the book of Job. In verse 5, when the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would sin and consecrate his children. Rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Now you go into the Hebrew of that. It's an interesting phrase and word curse. The word in the Hebrew is actually bless. Perhaps my sons have blessed God. But the context and the nature of the sacrifice gives a, a fuller meaning. And the meaning that comes across is perhaps my children have blessed God for the blessing and set 
God aside subtly. In effect, taking God for granted for what he has done. It's the very thing that Satan comes later and accuses Job of. Job is interested in what's going on in the hearts of his children. Pays particular attention as a parent. Wow. Do we ask one another, do we ask our kids, what's really going on in your life? What's going on in your heart? What's happening with your life? Do we take the time? Fathers especially, okay? Because oftentimes what happens in our lives is we just let our children go and do whatever don't, as long as they don't bother me in some of the things that I'm doing. I've had to learn, literally learn, to sit down with my kids, to ask them pointed questions, to find out what's in their hearts. Job was interested in their lives and concerned about sin. You know, we take sin for granted. Oh, man. I was, I was reading out of John MacArthur's book, The Vanishing Conscience, as I was thinking about this and got a quote out of it. John wrote this, I think, way back in, uh, in maybe the 90s. So this is dated somewhat, but I think the, the statement is very up to date. This is what he says. These days, everything wrong with humanity is likely to be explained as an illness. What we used to call sin is more easily diagnosed as a whole array of disabilities. All kinds of immorality and evil conduct are now identified as symptoms or this or that psychological illness. They don't even call it illness anymore. It's just a, a different gender or a different lifestyle. It's all okay now. Sin is set aside. Criminal behavior, various perverse passions, and even every imaginable addiction have all been made excusable by the crusade to label them medical afflictions or problems growing up of some sort. Sin is set aside, but not for Job. Because Job is a man who fears God, fears the Lord, and seeks to impact that before God. What a profound description of the righteousness of this man before God. This is Job. And I, and I would suggest that in an Old Testament sense, what is being described is Job is a saved man. Are you with me? He knows God. He really loves God. That he has a relationship with God. And God has a relationship with him. Now, in a New Testament sense, I think we experience some, something far greater, but that's because Jesus died, and it says that uh, he sends his Holy Spirit to live in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But I think the Spirit of God is overseeing Job. And so what I'm suggesting is, is that we ought to relate to him because of the nature of this salvation. And that we ought to respond the way in which he lives. He is devoted to God. What a profound relationship with Job. Now let's move on. And how my time slips away. Look at the presentation of Job by God to Satan. Now this is important, okay? We see it kind of stated here in almost a nonchalant way. Who in the world wrote this? Somebody must have known something about this. It must have been revealed later on so that it could be written down. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. God is not absent from his creation. He is always in control. And so the, the angels is really what he's talking about here. They come and they, they tell him what is happening. Now God knows anyway. But it shows that he has an oversight of what's taking place. Satan also come among, came among them. It's almost as if he slithered in, in my estimation. He's just there. 
And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come from? And he says, I'm from roaming about on the earth and walking around. He's just kind of wandering. It seems like it's aimless, but it's not. You know, the first Peter says, 5, says he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's doing his nefarious work from roaming about. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now stop there. What are you doing, God? Now, if, if you knew that God was pointing you out to Satan, would you say, God, don't point me out to him. God is initiating all of this. He is overseeing all of this, and he's got a purpose for what he wants to accomplish. He points Job out. There's no one like him on the earth, and then he says the same things that have already been written, blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. Satan responds, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. You've just protected him is what he's saying. You've just built him up. You've given him no test whatsoever. You've so protected him that he is, he's taken it all for granted. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. You know, there's some that come to this passage, and some later on, who wrestle with what God says towards the end of the book of Job. They say that God is bipolar. You ever heard that? You know what that means? Yeah, he has a good side to him, and he has a bad side to him. I think that's all rubbish, okay? I really do. But I was talking with a uh, son-in-law who was asking me that very question because somebody had talked to him about it. There are things, there are people who say that, that God has this dualistic nature to himself. And sometimes he does bad things. And, and really what he's using, Satan is a foil to, to kind of stir things up. It always reminds me of that Fiddler on the Roof story with Tevye, where Tevye says, God, you think things are too quiet down here. You just want to stir things up. You ever seen that movie where he says that? And I have to laugh because a lot of people think so. So why is God doing this? And why is he doing it with Satan? Because Satan is an evil personality. He's the fallen angel, all right? He is the devil and, a, and an evil person. Why does God invite him to look at Job? He's initiating everything. Well, many suggest that God's testing his faith to discover whether it is real. Now, I think God knows the end from the beginning, all right? So he knows what's going to go on with, with Job. But God does, at times, bring tests into our lives. He does. And you can see that in various other passages of Scripture. One of them is Abraham, remember? Go take Isaac and offer him as a sacrifice. How in the world can God ask that of Abraham? And yet Abraham responds positively and he does it. And Hebrews says that the reason he does it is that he believes that God will literally raise him from the dead. So there is tests that are going on. And there is an aspect of truth perhaps here in reference to Job, because as this begins to unfold, Job comes to a point where he says, I have done nothing wrong. Chapter 31. Like a prince, I will come before God, and I will make my complaint to him. That's why Elihu, Elihu gets so angry at him. Because he makes the... the gives the image that he's better than God or that he's greater than God and that he can establish justice better than God. So there are things that are happening with Job. But I think that there's something more that's going on. Because you see, if all of this was just to prove the faith 
of Job so that we were looking at him and saying, my, what a great faith that he has, and not realize down deep in our heart that the understanding of his faith is the fact that God himself is shaping that faith. God himself is the one that's giving meaning and power and purpose to that faith, then we would honor Job rather than God. I read it somewhere. Uh, it talked about it, reference to Moses. It's not that Moses had great faith. It's that Moses had faith in a great God. Same way with Job. He has faith in a great God. And so it's really God himself that is to be exalted. So what is going on here? What is happening? Well, God is using Satan to magnify the greatness of his saving power. And what Satan is willing to do is to slander, not only Job, but to slander God himself. Because in a manner of speaking, what he's saying to God is, you can't keep him. You don't have the power to keep him. He doesn't really love you for yourself. You haven't revealed yourself strong enough to him so that he really trusts in you. You can't keep him. Job, or God says of, of Job, he is my servant. He describes him this way. If Satan can get Job to curse God, turn his back on God, then in effect, what that's saying is, is that God's word is not true. <laughs> he doesn't have the capacity to care for his own. A lot of passages in the New Testament would be kind of swept away. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1.6. So this battle is between God and Satan. And in a manner of speaking, Job is caught in the middle of it. But sometimes that's the way it is with us. I would suggest as well that there's something theological going on here, which I've said as well to you before, is, is that the friends actually believed, and I think it's probably a, a mindset that was permeating. They actually believe that if you're good, you would be blessed. And if you're bad, you will get judgment or bad things. Um, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, that is at the heart of that, their theology. You realize? And so God is dealing with something that is going on here. And he's doing so because he is a saving God. God wants to deal with all of this. It can only be done in a, an extended way so that these truths would be able to come out and be faced. So he's putting Job in the line of fire. But you realize that the issues are exceedingly important. <coughs> It's not just that I'm testing Job to see whether he's good enough or not. It's that God is doing something so that people would realize the significance of who he is as a savior. And, and that comes out in his speeches. Most people look at his speeches and think that he's just taking Job wandering around with animals and other things. No, I think what God is saying is is in those speeches that he, right from the very start, has established justice and judgment. It's written into creation. And that he ultimately, he himself ultimately, will deal with evil. And that needs to be known, and we need to know that as well, down deep in our hearts. Satan says, but put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your faith, face. Why? Because Job's faith is only in his good fortune. But God knows the end from the beginning. God is not cut off here, guard here. He is doing things in order to reveal himself even more purposefully. He sets all of this in motion. 
Now, look at the promotion of evil by Satan, and I'll try to rush through some of this, but I, I'm on a roll. Do you mind? <laughs> I want to be sensitive to you. Um, the promotion of evil, Satan is evil. It just flows here. All right? One thing after another. I think Satan sets all of this out so that one wave after another. They say that bad things come in threes, right? This came in fours in order to extend it. All of his stuff is lost. And then the end, all ten children are killed. Now you're close enough to Andover when that tornado came. And wasn't it nice to know that nobody was hurt? <laughs> Can you imagine the feeling uh, of the society as well surrounding if all of a family, all the children were taken at once? I'm sure some of you have been watching some of the news down in Uvalde, right? And seeing the horrible things that have gone up where they shot up a, an elementary school, 19 children. I was watching some of that where some of the parents, because the police weren't going in immediately, I'll go in. Can you imagine the agony that is there? I'll go in. I'll, I'll bring my child out. I think some of them actually did slip in to get their children and bring them out. Can you imagine the, the agony within Job that all of this happened? And the way it was done, you see, because of the manner in which it was done, there is a supernatural element. It wasn't just accidents. It all happens to everybody. It didn't happen that way. The way it happened planted within him his mind the understanding that something unique is going on here. And God has oversight. And how do I deal with that? Look at how he deals with it. And this is where we wanna, want, wanted to get to. Look at the profession of faith that he speaks. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is a profound declaration of faith and worship. Tearing his robe, shaving his head, all of those are ritual expressions of sorrow. He's doing what would be common in their society. It's all controlled and reflective. He's not wailing and whining here. It's all very disciplined in terms of expressing the fact that as he responds to this, he will respond in recognition of a God who is in control. And then he says this, naked I came, naked I shall return, the Lord gave. The Lord, the term Lord is the term for Yahweh, covenant keeping name of God. Um, what he is saying here in effect is, is that I own nothing for myself. Everything I possess is a gift from the blessing of God. God will show his covenant-keeping character to me in the giving of blessing, and he will do so and does do so in the taking. Remember that song, you give and take away, you give and take away. That's the, the refrain to that song. Blessed be his name. Every time I sing that song, I hear it, you know, it's, it's into my heart because it comes out of this passage. God is blessed is what he's saying when he does it. That's his character. There's no complaint here towards him. There's simply a depth of faith and trust in God. No bitterness. I was reading... I think it was tortured for Christ, and, I, and I'm sure whether this is illustration is directly from that. 
Richard Wormbrand wrote Tortured for Christ. He's the one that, that started Voice for the Martyrs. You know, he was in a communist prison for years and years. And one of the stories he told was uh, where he would be stood up within a cell and knives would be all around him. You know, and he'd have to stand there because if he leaned one direction or another, he'd get into these sharp knives and they would cut him. And he would begin to bleed, you know, and horrendous suffering that was taking place. But one of the things that he said, and he spoke it in this fashion, bless you prison. There was no bitterness. Bless you prison. Why could he say that? Because God in his presence and in his majesty was making himself known in powerful ways so that he would sense that he is there. Now, why can Job say this? That I would suggest that he goes back to chapter 29 where he's talking about the friendship of God being over my... Job experienced God's grace in an abundant way, and he saw it in that fashion. The outpouring of God's grace was upon his life. It literally flowed over him, and he understood it was his grace. And he was living in the midst of that. And he understood God responded to him. And so in the strength of that understanding of grace, he could face whatever it is that was coming upon him. He could say this. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. And so I ask, do you have this kind of intimacy with God? Are, are you prepared to lose maybe something that is so precious to you? Now, I can't hardly imagine that. As I was thinking of this, uh, it reminded me of Ezekiel 24. I don't know whether you know your Bible well enough to know what's going on. There, Ezekiel, it says, would lose his wife that who was precious to him, and it was as a testimony of the fact that Israel would lose Jerusalem. It would be destroyed. I can't hardly imagine that. God asks of us, stretches us in ways that we hardly, hardly imagine. We want to push it from us. My wife um, in seminary typed my thesis she didn't really want me to spend that much time in Job. <laughs> and yet the result, the result is so much greater. The blessing is so much greater. The impact upon society and for us as well that we would deal with this man <laughs> And what went on in his life? Isn't that profound? Well, God is doing the same with us. And he has given us the capacity. He who did not spare his own son, will he not also with him give you all things? Romans 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for their time together. I thank you for these folks and their patience with me. I pray that you and your grace would literally fill our hearts with that sense of wonder over who you are, your blessedness. Teach us, Father, to know you, to know you and the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Help us to know you in truth. And we will bless you no matter what takes place in our lives. We will give thanks to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Um, blessed be your name. That's the song we had planned for now, but seeing the time, I'll spare you that. We might do it next week. So, uh, But, yeah, he gives and he takes away. So um, you all have a blessed week. Um, go in the grace of God. You're dismissed.